So good evening and welcome to the 2015 Darwin College Lectures on the theme of development. I'd like to welcome everyone here in the Lady Mitchell Hall and those people in the Overflow Halls. This is the 30th year of the Darwin College Lectures and we're delighted that by watching online thousands of people can join our Friday evenings here in Cambridge. 30 years is a long time. The college has doubled in size through those decades. Now we have about 700 students and they come from roughly 75 countries around the world. So we'll go back a century and more and Darwinians should not forget that there were two great intellects on board HMS Beagle. Without Captain Robert Fitzroy, would Charles Darwin have developed into quite such a great figure? Fitzroy later founded the Met Office, whose chief scientist, Professor Dame Julia Slingo, is our speaker tonight. Now, the development of the Met Office and weather forecasting is a great saga in its own right. CTR Wilson, inventor of the cloud chamber and everything that followed, including, of course, CERN in Geneva and so on, was inspired by the role of clouds while he was a weather observer on Bel Nevis. Another key person was Lewis Fry Richardson, father of numerical weather analysis. And he developed the mathematics or the equations for the first numerical analysis of weather while he was an ambulance driver on the Western Front. And he published this soon after the war. Important also is another mathematician, Harold Jeffries, uh, also rediscoverer of Bayesian statistics. Jeffries showed how cyclones are vital to the general circulation of the atmosphere. As Richardson said of turbulence, big whirls have little whirls that feed on their velocity, and little whirls have lesser whirls, and so on to viscosity. <laughs> From all of this came the very modern weather forecast. Our safety and economy today owe a great deal to the Richardsons, uh, to Richardson and Jeffries and many others. So Professor Dame Julia Slingo is their heir today at the Met Office. She began her distinguished career studying physics at Bristol University, subsequently working at the Met Office, the European Centre for Medium Term Weather Forecasts, the National Centre for Atmospheric Research in Boulder in Colorado, and as Professor of Meteorology at the University of Reading. With Jeffries and Richardson, her awards include the Buchan Prize of the Royal Meteorological Society. Last year, she was awarded the DBE. Today, we expect accurate weather forecasts out to the fifth day or more. But climate seems a different puzzle. What climate will we bequeath to our children and our grandchildren? Of all the challenges facing humanity, this is amongst the greatest. So Dame Julia, thank you for coming to speak to us about the development of climate. And thank you for a, a wonderful introduction, actually, and picking up some of the strands that I won't have time to cover in this lecture tonight. I have to say, when I was invited to do this, and I knew it was about mechanisms of change as sort of one of the things to think about, I thought, goodness me, what am I going to say? And uh, so what I am going to do is give you an entirely personal view of the development of climate science, little snippets, really, uh, through history and then into the present day. And what now is arguably, um, as has already alluded to, one of the great challenges for the 21st century, climate change. But that is not just cli what climate science is about. It's actually about so much more. And so what I want to give a sense tonight is of the whole range of things that climate science pulls together and how we've come to be where we are today. And I can look back to my first days in dynamical climatology, as it was called, in the Met Office in the early 70s, 
where in a sense we were at the right at the beginnings of climate modelling and uh, uh, trying to understand how the climate system worked. So, well, we better start with saying, well, what is climate? And who else to turn to in a way but um, Mark Twain, whether he said it or not. Climate is what you expect, weather is what you get. And in a sense, actually, uh, the separation of the two is a shame, in a sense, because that, I think, to some extent, dogged climate science for quite a long time. We'll come back to that towards the end of the lecture. Because actually, climate and weather, it's the same fundamental physics, it's the same things going on. Climate is just the average of the weather over some time period. Um, and increasingly, as my career developed, I got really very interested in the fact that could climate models actually represent the weather? Because if they couldn't, they couldn't really tell us about the climate. Because these two things are so intimately related. So what do I think cl what climate science is all about? It's about under understanding the Earth's climate through a combination of theory, observations, and these days, computational models. Um, and it's about understanding all sorts of forcings on the climate system, and the most obvious one today is greenhouse gas changes. But actually, it can be about understanding all sorts of things about the climate system. And I think climate science, well, it's a relatively young phrase. I don't remember it being around when I joined the Met Office. If anything, I considered myself to be a meteorologist, maybe an atmospheric physicist. But I think, you know, climate science is synonymous, really, with meteorology, climatology, oceanography, um, atmospheric physics, ocean physics, and so on. So it's a sort of catch-all, really. And to be a climate scientist, in some ways, you have to be a polymath. And as my career has progressed, I've had to learn about all sorts of things that I never expected to do when I joined the Met Office. Um, so it is, it, you have to be almost a jack of all trades, and maybe, dare I say it, an expert of none. And that therein, of course, lies one of the problems with it. And just going back to dear old uh, Fitzroy, um, when he made his first weather forecast, he got it right, and the next time he got it wrong. And actually, the Royal Society decided that meteorology was not a proper science. And to some extent, we still live with that, because those of us who do this sort of science are polymaths. We're not specialists. Um, so that's just a little bit of a personal view. But let's start at the beginning, and, and of course, for... The climate is understanding, as it says, what you expect. And at the roots of this, for the UK at least, was uh, our maritime history. And so we have to start with Edmund Halley, or Hawley, um, who wrote a paper way back in 1686 about the trade winds and monsoons observable in the seas between and near the tropics with an attempt to assign the physical cause of the said wind. So here we are, uh, knowing that these winds, and he's, you probably can't see it, but with the monsoon winds, he, do, he drew two dashes to show that the wind reversed between winter and summer. Whereas, say, for the southern half of the Indian Ocean, the wind blew always from that southeasterly direction. And uh, Hawley's idea was that it was just that the movement of the sun as it went round the equator around the tropics uh, caused the air to heat and to rise and it had to pull in air from somewhere else as the sun went past. That was his thinking. A uh, very simple uh, idea of a, a very, uh, almost you might say, a flat earth view of what's going on. And then we had George Hadley and the Hadley circulation. Now George Hadley, not much later, he said something a bit different. He started to talk about the diurnal rotation, and here he means that the fact that we're living on a rotating sphere. And he starts to talk about the relative motion of air, and that if it has to move uh, towards the equator, then um, you will need to produce a, you will drive an easterly wind, so you have a northeasterly and you have southeasterly. 
And he, he was there working with the conservation of absolute velocity. And of course, he also noticed that if the air converged somewhere on the equator, being the warmest part of the world, and the air rises, then through mass continuity, the air had to descend somewhere else. So he had these ideas in his mind way back at the end of the 17th century and into the 18th century. And he wasn't really recognized for this until about 100 years later that he'd actually picked on what is absolutely crucial about weather and climate is that we live uh, on a rotating sphere with a fluid atmosphere that feels that rotation. So he is Hadley, Hadley already trying to understand why the winds are doing what they're doing. And then, of course, we get uh, Coriolis, who, although he didn't actually do anything about a rotating sphere, he did actually talk about the effects of rotation on the uh, perceived motion of a, um, an object. But, of course, it became known eventually as the Coriolis force, where, again, these are, this is a very, very rapid run through uh, some of these ideas. Ferrell, who then actually uh, really saw how the work of Coriolis could be related to how the air moves, particularly in mid-latitudes, uh, as a result of the Earth's rotation. And as he said, if a body is moving in any direction, there is a force arising from the Earth's rotation, which always deflects it to the right in the northern hemisphere and to the left in the southern hemisphere. And so here we are explaining, uh, in this case, the uh, westerlies in mid-latitudes. But Farrell recognised here that actually it wasn't the conservation of absolute velocity as Hadley had assumed, but of course the conservation of absolute angular momentum. So here we are, the feral cell is the sort of, if you like, the, the mid-latitude polar counterpart of the Hadley circulation. And then jumping forward by a long way, we come to Rossby. And uh, in the 1930s, really, I think, set the foundations of dynamical meteorology and oceanography. So it was his understanding, and he was actually originally looking at things like the Gulf Stream. It was him, Rossby, that established the theory of planetary waves, what we now call Rossby waves, which again, as a result of the Earth's rotation, and in this case, the stratification of the atmosphere and the ocean. And of course, we'll all recognize these sorts of maps that we see here. Uh, this, is a, this is an example of evolving Rossby waves running along the bar barrier between the tropical warm air to the south and the polar cold air to the north around what we would call the jet stream. And of course, that's absolutely uh, from, from Rossby waves and this concept of something called potential vorticity became really the birth of dynamical meteorology, um, Ertl's potential vorticity, on through the great work of uh, many people, one or two who might be sitting in this audience today, um, but certainly people like um, Brian Hoskins at Reading University who began to understand the association of this um, and, and other great work by other people, that the association of Rossby waves and uh, weather systems, but increasingly also the association between uh, perturbations in heating in the deep tropics and their ability uh, to generate Rossby waves around the mid-latitudes and so on and so forth. So in all of this, the beginnings of climate science were bound up with the beginnings in a sense of what we might call meteorology. Now in parallel to all the, the uh, work that was done to try and understand the circulation, if you like, of uh, the, the climate system. We had other people, atmospheric physicists in this case, trying to understand the energy balance of the planet. And of course, here is John Tyndall now in the 19th century, uh, working out uh, really for the first time why the Earth is as warm as it is. And he showed that the Earth had to have a greenhouse effect. In other words, it had to be able to trap heat energy 
within its atmosphere um, so that the planet's surface temperature was, would, is much warmer than you would expect just simply from a balance at the surface of the amount of solar radiation that enters the, the planet and reaches the surface and how that's balanced by the loss of heat energy to space. And he also showed that the, uh, these gases, these greenhouse gases, and he looked at a, a number of them, uh, were also emitters as well as absorbers of infrared radiation. So we began to understand indeed how the greenhouse effect worked and what might happen if you started to change the amount of these absorbers and emitters in the atmosphere. And then we get to Arrhenius, who arguably made the first prediction of global warming. So these sort of things are carrying on almost in parallel, I would say. The atmospheric, the, the, the physics, the radiation balance of the planet versus the dynamics and the meteorology of the planet. And, and he, in, uh, very early on, had already decided that if you doubled the percentage of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, you'd raise the temperature of the Earth's surface by four degrees. Now, we don't think that it's likely to be that high, but actually it's within the plausible range that we think could be uh, the result of a doubling of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. But look what he says afterwards, and this actually covered a lot of it for a long time afterwards, that he thought that um, we were probably due to enter another ice age, and therefore actually this wouldn't be a bad thing. Um, uh, he says, there does not appear to be much ground for such an apprehension. The enormous combustion of coal by our industrial establishments suffices to increase the percentage of carbon dioxide in the air to a perceptible degree. And then he says, but by the influence of the increasing percentage of carbon as carbonic acid in the atmosphere, we may hope to enjoy ages with more equable and better climates, especially as regards the colder regions of the earth, ages when the earth will bring forth much more abundant crops than at present for the benefit of rapidly propagating mankind. So here we are. Uh, from Arrhenius, the idea that actually uh, global warming may not quite be such a bad deal because we must surely be time for an ice age. I want to then step sideways. So we've gone through the fundamentals of dynamical meteorology and to some extent oceanography, and we've gone seen the beginnings of the greenhouse effect and global warming. I'm going to step sideways now to India. And uh, here's Henry Blanford in India in the late 19th century. He was the first British director of the Indian Meteorological Department. And actually, he thought that he'd found in India somewhere where he could understand a lot about atmospheric phenomena, weather and things like that. He says, order and regularity are as prominent characteristics of our India's atmospheric phenomena as are caprice and uncertainty those of their European counterparts. So, of course, what he's seeing is that in, in, in uh, Europe, in Britain, we were obviously getting the sorts of weather that we see all the time, always changing. And what he saw in India was a regular seasonal cycle. And actually, what he's really talking about is that the diurnal cycle. And he'd noticed that the pressure the biggest signal in the pressure was mostly the diurnal pressure wave rather than the huge excursions of pressure that we see in mid-latitudes. But then came the Great Famine of 1876-78. And there we see a very interesting, from a historical point of view, the conjunction of politics and science again. Because India's economy was single-mindedly focused on its grain harvests, and India was really accounted for about a fifth of the British Empire's um, GDP, if you like. And the Indian taxes to administer the country and pay dividends to its investors depended entirely on the monsoon rains, which failed dramatically in 1876-77. And now we know, of course, when we look at the records of El Nino, 
that it was tied up with something that was actually going on from far away in the tropical East Pacific. 1876-77 was probably the biggest El Nino uh, on record and certainly um, as profound as the, the El Nino we had in 1997-98. And what was quite clear was that there was enormous pressure on Blandford to try and work, do something about this. And there was this idea was already emerging of uh, forecasting, of course. And we've seen Fitzroy making his first weather forecast in 1861 in the UK. And Blandford and colleagues felt that actually the one way you could control famine would be through climate prediction, would mean that India could be governed more effectively if you knew what was coming. So he started to try and work out why were the monsoons were okay some years and why were they not okay in other years. And here's one of his first attempts to try and understand that. On the connection of the Himalaya snowfall with dry winds and seasons of drought in India. And he says, the apparent dependence of the 1876 drought on the remarkable and uns unseasonable persistence of uh, dry northwest winds down the whole of Western India. The experience of recent years affords many instances of an unusually heavy and especially a late fall of snow on the northwestern Himalaya, being followed by a period of prolonged drought on uh, the plains of northwest and, and western India. And this idea that the snow on the Tibetan highlands would affect the progress of the monsoon has been around ever since. And it's really only since we've been, doing, been able to do some experiments on this with models that we've been able to show that actually this probably wasn't the reason. And of course now we know that actually 1876 was all due to El Nino. But here's the beginning, in a sense, of really statistical climatology, or another branch of climate science, of trying to understand why regional climate variations happen and what their cause is. And if you can understand their cause, then perhaps you might be able to predict them. So this is a really quite a separate branch of climate science that we now see begin to emerge uh, in, in, uh, in India. And then we come to probably my great hero, Sir Gilbert Thomas Walker, who came to India at the beginning of the 20th century. And he really got his teeth into statistical climate forecasting. Prior to that, Blanford and a, another scientist called Charles Todd had already sort of corresponded with each other and noted that when things were poor in India, they were also poor around Indonesia and Australia. In other words, there was coherence to, to the rainfall anomalies in quite large areas. And they began to sort of wonder if there was something much bigger going on. And it was really Blanford who um, set up this enormous, really a human computer with Indian staff, performing all these statistical correlations. And he says, I think that the relationships of world weather are so complex that our only chance of explaining them is to accumulate the facts empirically. And uh, he was remarkably successful because actually we can attribute to Gilbert Walker the terms the Southern Oscillation, uh, the North Atlantic Oscillation, and the North Pacific Oscillation. And these things still pervade climate science today. So he was a great man. Of course, he understood the associations, but he, of course, could not derive the cause. Correlation does not give you causality. And in fact, it would be um, quite a long time after that that the real causes of the Southern Oscillation were really understood. And, they, and here we are uh, into now the, the 1960s and Bjorknes, who actually associated something going on in the ocean, something called El Nino, with the Southern Oscillation. And the uh, idea of the El Nino Southern Oscillation was born. And this idea, and, and very clear now, that climate is not just about the weather and statistics of the weather, it is actually all about a coupled ocean atmosphere system. And so we have here Enzo and the Walker circulation coming together 
as not just something that happens in the atmosphere, but by, driven by persistent changes in ocean surface temperatures around the tropics. And here's a schematic of the perturbations to what we now call the work, walker circulation, which are these vertical uh, ascending and descending branches around the tropics, very schematic. They don't really, the air doesn't really do quite that, but actually it gives you a very good idea of where the, sh the changes in rainfall will occur between an El Nino and La Nina. So here we are now at an understanding that climate is not just about the atmosphere, but it's also about the ocean. And behind all of that, all through the early part of the 20th century, uh, were also a lot of interest, the geologists began to get involved in paleoclimate perspectives. And they were looking at geological records there, the, and, and noting that actually the, the, the idea that the Earth's climate was stable um, and didn't, hadn't, doesn't change was not actually holding up. And of course, uh, we had the Milankovitch cycles began to emerge uh, where it's actually changes in the uh, orbit of the Earth around the Sun. Um, and then, of course, a lot of documentation of the medieval warm period, the Little Ice Age, which appear to be related. And we're still not quite sure, uh, in this case, to variations in the output of the Sun, but also perhaps to variations in very slow ocean circulations, like the Atlantic thermohaline circulation. So alongside all of the theoretical work on dynamical meteorology, on uh, the greenhouse effect, uh, the statistical climate science that was going on to try and understand why the, the climate in a region varies in the way it does, we also have this backdrop of increasing interest in past climates. And then I think when I entered the Met Office round about that time, I think it's fair to say nothing to do with me, we had the beginnings of the transformation of climate science. When a sense a lot of these strands started to come together. The first of these was actually Earth observation. Until the early 70s, we had certainly very good networks of atmospheric observations of things like radiostons and surface weather stations. And we had some measurements of the ocean from ocean uh, research vessels, from, from uh, uh, shipping in general. And I can still remember almost the first uh, satellite image coming in of the Earth's clouds, which was what I was working on at that time trying to understand why clouds form where they do in the atmosphere, plowing away through lots and lots of radio sonde descents, trying to understand why the clouds were where they were. And then all of a sudden you get this fabulous view of the distribution of clouds around the world. Now, of course, we almost take that for granted, but this has been one of the great transformations of climate science. We now know immense amount about the current state of our atmosphere, our oceans, our land surface, and so on, from a vast array of satellites that, circum that circle around the atmosphere and from many, many uh, observing systems, including things like commercial aircraft and so forth. We know an awful lot about what's happening. So now we can actually describe some very fundamental things about the climate system. And uh, this is the most fundamental thing. This was what Tyndall was trying to understand, which was what's the flow of energy through the whole planet. At a very basic level, what are the global flows of energy? And uh, it's much more complicated than I'm sure he ever imagined. That yes, we do have uh, greenhouse gases sitting in the atmosphere, uh, changing the balance of, of how much outlook going long wave radiation comes out at the top of the atmosphere. Um, but actually, when you look at how all these things happen, we see that actually it's much more complicated than that because clouds are involved as well. And clouds act mostly as black bodies and they also 
emit radiation to space and emit radiation back to the surface. So when we look at the surface balance, it's actually more complicated than the straight balance at the top of the atmosphere. We see quite a lot of energy coming in from the sun, reaching the surface. And in fact, because of the greenhouse effect, the total amount of irradiation that's lost from the surface through heat is actually quite small because a lot of it that is emitted by the Earth as a black body comes back from the atmosphere because of the greenhouse gases and the clouds. So actually you've only got 60 watts per metre squared here, but you've got 161 there. How do we balance it? We balance it through evaporation, evapotranspiration, through the, through the vaporisation of water from particularly the ocean surface. That is a cooling agent. It's a little bit here from what we call sensible heat, dry heat, but the majority of this balance now is achieved partly through the long wave radiation or heat, but particularly through evaporation. So the water cycle becomes rather a critical part of the whole balance of the Earth's uh, energy budget. If we look at the atmosphere and look just at the radiation terms, we'd find that actually the atmosphere is cooling all the time radiatively. Um, and how is, how is that balanced in the atmosphere? Well, it's balanced by the fact that you've taken water from the surface as vapour and you condense it uh, in the atmosphere as clouds and rainfall. So you put that heat back into the atmosphere. So the atmosphere comes into balance in terms of what we call radiative convective equilibrium. The water cycle is absolutely fundamental in all of this. And it's the water cycle that makes actually the Earth's energy flows so complicated because you can take heat from here and put heat up there. And when you create clouds, of course, you also change then the properties, the radiative properties of the planet. We know all these things now, and we know that uh, uh, the water cycle is fundamental. It's actually, um, as I learnt in my early days in climate modelling, uh, the radiative cooling of the atmosphere is a very strong con constraint on the mean precipitation rate. And that comes into play later on when we look at climate change and how global warming will change the water cycle. Let's go down a level and look at the fact that uh, we live on a, a sphere um, and in fact uh, the tropics are that bit closer to the sun than the extra tropics and because we're a sphere they receive more energy than the polar regions. And this is just looking now at the radiative heating, the total radiative heating of the planet as a function of latitude. So now we have a situation where actually when we go away from the global mean to the, to the latitudinal mean, we have a system that is clearly out of balance. So whilst those balances exist for the global average, they don't exist at, at particular parts of the, of the Earth. And so we have excess energy heating being taken up in the tropics and the polar regions are cooling all the time. So how is the planet going to come back into some sort of equilibrium? Well, it does it, of course, by transporting heat from the equator to the poles. And uh, this is now a pretty robust diagram of this. This um, these seem to have got moved a bit. This is the, the this is the integral across latitude of the uh, meridional, the the north or southward transport of heat uh, that's required to balance the total. Uh, radiative heating of the planet. So it's an integral function. What you need to take away from this is that uh, the shape of this curve implies heat coming out from this part and being converged in that. So there's a transport that is poleward in both hemispheres. This is the total. How is it achieved? It's achieved predominantly actually by the atmosphere. And we didn't really know that until actually round about at uh, the time that I was starting work in the Met Office. The famous oceanographer Sverdrup said, 
that in 1957 he thought that the atmosphere and oceans played an almost equal role in that heat transport. In fact, most of the heat is transported by the atmosphere, despite the fact that its heat capacity is a fraction of the ocean. So you might have expected that the oceans would play a much bigger role in moving heat uh, from the equator to the poles. There's also some very interesting structures here around the fact that whilst the, the total energy is equal between the two hemispheres, the way in which the ocean and the atmosphere transport heat is not. And in fact, for the uh, ocean, uh, a lot of this, th these differences occur in the way that the Atlantic works. So this is the picture that we now have, a very clear role for the atmosphere and a secondary role for the, for the ocean of bringing our planet into balance everywhere in the, in, 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 in the uh, Earth system. How is that achieved? Well, actually, it's weather in the atmosphere defines the climate. So here we are again, back to the weather. How is that energy transport achieved? It's achieved by the weather systems that we see day by day going past us. Um, here's the uh, Hadley circulation here. Um, but look, these, all these energy transport happened uh, in these weather systems, these Rossby waves that I talked about earlier on. Um, so here we have uh, how the, the, the Earth's climate really works is because weather defines it. And critical to all of that are phase changes of water that are moving heat around the system. So to understand how our climate system works, we actually now have to understand how the water cycle works. And these, again, were things that we didn't really know when I started my career in the early 1970s. When we mean the water cycle, we mean all of this. Uh, how water is evaporated from the surface, how it gets transported around the atmosphere, where it gets condensed, where the rainfall falls, either on the oceans or on the land, how it percolates through rivers and out into the sea. This is the whole water cycle. And what's so um, interesting about Earth's climate is because it can sustain water in three forms vapour, liquid and solid. And it's that transfer between those three phases that makes the uh, study, particularly of the troposphere, the, the part of the atmosphere where clouds form and rain form, so really interesting. Because what it means is that you can, as I said, take heat from one part of the system and move it through atmospheric transports and produce heat in a completely remote part of the system. What does it look like? Well, again, we didn't really know this in the 1970s. We had a bit of an idea of what the uh, rainfall distribution was like uh, around the planet. This is one of the more recent <coughs> estimates. I would say we still don't entirely know these things, even with our latest instruments on satellites. The uh, annual mean rainfall is still, to some extent, slightly uncertain, and recent work has suggested that actually the global mean value of this might be higher than we've thought. But this is the distribution, and what we can see here is that the heaviest rain occurs just as uh, um, in, in the deep tropics in the rising part of the Hadley cell, of the Hadley circulation, and, and, and Hadley recognised that and that the dry regions are in the subsiding parts of the Hadley circulation. And a lot of the rainfall is concentrated in this region that we call the warm pool of the Indo-Pacific Ocean here. We often call this the engine house of the global circulation. And there are real regional variations here that are associated with what the ocean's doing, where the land masses are, where the mountains are. And we can see here the rainfall associated with the, uh, what we call our storm track here in the North Atlantic and the weather systems that bring rain to us and the same in the Pacific. So that's what rainfall looks like. Well, where does all that water for that rainfall come from? 
Well, it has to come from evaporation. And this is a picture that shows the precipitation minus the evaporation. So where it's negative, it's basically saying this is where the evaporation's happening. And where it's positive, it's saying this is where uh, it's raining. And what we see is that the evaporation is not in the same place as where the rainfall happens. In other words, we take most of the water that is, is needed to fuel these rain areas all around the tropics are coming from regions in the trade winds, in those regions that Hawley and Hadley were talking about. Um, and that, 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 that water is then transported into these regions, often as part of monsoon systems, uh, by the winds, by those trade winds that we, we talked about right at the very beginning. And what that means is that you're actually extracting fresh water from these parts of the oceans here and dumping fresh water in these parts here. So it's this very now complex uh, description of the water cycle that is bound up, as we said right a few slides earlier, in the global mean energy balance of the climate system. So water is very, very integral to all of this. And we see that precipitation evaporation figure reflected in now the salinity of the ocean. So this is a picture of the surface salinity of the ocean. And what we see here is that the most saline waters are where the atmosphere, where most of the evaporation of fresh water to the atmosphere to feed the rain regions comes from. So what this looks like is very much a reflection of that precipitation minus evaporation picture. So here we are, the atmospheric water cycle imprinting itself on the ocean salinity. Why is that important? Well, because salinity is one of the critical factors that drives what I call weather in the ocean. And it's weather in the ocean that it also defines the climate. So it is this relationship here now between uh, density is really what drives these big ocean currents and the winds. And we can see here uh, similarities with the the trade winds driving some of these, the North Atlantic gyre is all tied up with the uh, North Atlantic subtropical anticyclone, the same with the Pacific gyre and the Peruvian <coughs> current here. But actually salinity is, plays a really important role in changing the density of the ocean and therefore changing the way in which heat is moved around the ocean, how heat can be sequestered at depth because the salinity is increased and made the water more dense. We now understand much more about, as I say, you have to be a polymath to be a climate scientist. You have to understand how the oceans work alongside how the atmosphere is behaving and how the water cycle fits into all of these things. So this is where we've arrived at today as a result of observing the planet in much, much greater detail and combining that with theory and also models to come up with this much more complete description of the climate system than we had, I would argue, 40 years ago. The second transformation, of course, is general circulation modelling. Um, has been a major factor in the development of climate science. As we came through and into the, the middle of the 20th century, you could argue that actually we had a pretty good handle on a lot of the fundamental physics in terms of the atmospheric dynamics of radiative transfer, those sorts of things. Um, in practice, of course, to model them, you have to solve those equations on a, co on a computer. And that was where things began to get tricky because computers were very small at that time, so you had to, to uh, uh, discretize your equations uh, in quite complicated ways. And the development of general circulation models really um, paralleled the development of numerical weather prediction. And uh, this year will be the 50th anniversary of the Met Office's first numerical weather prediction. And it's about that time that general circulation modelling really began to take off. So again, here we have uh, 
weather and climate coming together within that history of modeling. And here's the first paper, a general, the general circulation of the atmosphere in numerical experiment by Norman Phillips, 1955, from Princeton. Um, and he was able to run his model for about 20 days or so before it blew up. And uh, it was a very simple construct, but actually he noticed that things developed within his simulation uh, that looked like weather systems on a background temperature gradient. He thought he could see things like fronts emerging and so forth. It was a groundbreaking simulation. I can't imagine how he managed to do it, um, knowing what sort of computing resources we had at that time. But there followed and I'm literally, I'm just going to pick out one or two examples. Some really great work that came also out of Princeton, 1965, Smagorinsky, Manabi and Holloway, numerical results from a nine level general circulation model of the atmosphere. Phillips had only managed to do a two level model of the atmosphere. We now had nine levels, but it was a dry model. It didn't have any uh, changes. It didn't have the water cycle and it had very, very simple radiative cooling, so it wasn't doing a radiative proper radiation calculation. So lots of things were fixed, and he noticed, they noticed that the, uh, the energy budget was really much stronger, uh, working much harder, the winds were blowing much faster than they should be. And almost at the same time, they obviously had been working through this, and now it's Manabi, Smagorinsky, and Strickler who simulated climatology of a general circulation model with a hydrologic cycle. And they found that once they introduced the hydrological cycle, many of the aspects of the general circulation improved dramatically. And this was, these were the papers that I studied with great interest when I joined the Met Office in 1972 and went into the dynamical climatology branch to try and understand what was going on. And we were at that point building a five-level model. We couldn't run it at that time for more than about 30 days. So we used to run perpetual January or perpetual July simulations, because that was all we could do to see whether we could get the two extremes of the seasonal cycle something like right. Um, but what was really now coming to the fore in all of this was the fact that actually, yes, we could do the dynamics, but actually what was really driving the climate system and the general circulation were a lot of things that actually we couldn't resolve in the models, what we now call the unresolved processes and this idea of parameterization. So how do we represent things going on at the subgrid scale on the scale of the model that we could use. And so work was going on actively in uh, the dynamical climatology branch when I joined to try and understand the boundary layer. I worked very much with a new way of representing cumulus convection as a, a sort of max, mass flux concept, uh, which we tested actually in an experiment that was against observations from an experiment over West Africa and the Atlantic in 1974. And we, we didn't know anything much at that stage about the importance of breaking waves, gravity waves, as producing a drag on the atmosphere. That came in the early 1980s. But my job was actually to try and represent the whole spectral uh, characteristics of the radiation field, especially the long wave radiation field. So I wrote a new radiation code that tried to separate out the effects of water vapor and carbon dioxide and ozone in particular. And using that scheme, um, I did a study which was published in 1980. So this is, this is, you know, what the state of the science is like there. A study of the Earth's radiation budget using a general circulation model. We didn't really understand at that time how snow, clouds, gas, water vapor, lapse rate, all uh, set up the seasonal cycle of the Earth's radiation budget. 
This was the first simulation through a full seasonal cycle. Um, and I was able to uh, use it to see whether I could understand how much heat the oceans were transporting. And this was the result I got. And actually, uh, if you look at this integral of the net radiation here, I think this is at um, units of, of 5 here, 10 to the 15 watts. Just over 5 was what the model was telling me was the peak of that integral. Now, today, with all the Earth observation that we have, the number is close to just under six. So actually, we were really doing some pretty good stuff, even with a very simple model, and a, but, a, but a, a very careful representation of radiative transfer. If we also look at this, you'll see actually that I inferred what the ocean heat flux was doing. And actually, it's a bit on the high side, but I actually did get right this, this interesting difference around the equator. And the problem was that the atmosphere in this five-level model, with a resolution of something like 300 kilometers, the atmospheric eddies, the Rossby waves, were not strong enough to transport enough heat. So in fact, this number should be way up here, and it's down there. So that was the fault with the model. It was too coarse resolution. But actually, it's a remarkable example of how far you can get with quite simple set of equations, quite simple constructs to show how the uh, energy balance of the Earth works. And of course, what's been the big revolution, I would say, transformation of climate science, it's supercomputing because actually the modeling and the supercomputing go hand in hand. And this is just an example of some of the machines that I've had my hands on over my career. And of course, you know, we can look back to the early days of numerical weather prediction, and uh, uh, these days it would run in a fraction of a second on a mobile phone. Um, lots more to talk about here. This is our current latest machine. Uh, one petaflop. We are just about to procure a major new machine, thanks to the uh, government's generosity um, of 97 million. So this is what it takes to do this sort of science for weather and climate, and it'll be roughly the 12 times the power of, of the uh, one we have currently in the uh, computer halls at Exeter. But what have these machines allowed us to do? Well, they've allowed us to increase the resolution of our climate models, our general circulation models. And this is just a, a snapshot example, looking at, this is the water vapor, somewhere in the middle troposphere. Uh, and it acts very much um, almost like a tracer. And you can see uh, here this very high resolution simulation. Here's a frontal system approaching the UK with all the, the high water content uh, along the frontal systems there. As you go down in resolution to 60 kilometers and then to 130 kilometers, you can see how that moisture transport by the weather systems is degraded. And if you remember that the water cycle is fundamental to the climate system, this is really important. This is what we typically have had to use in IPCC on our climate change simulations in most climate models. Over the, last, the, over the last few years that I was at Reading University, we pioneered going to resolutions like this. This is what we're now testing at the Met Office. This is now our workhorse model for climate. This is what we're testing for the future. So supercomputer power is absolutely vital. There's no change in the science underpinning these simulations. It is literally raw power. Look at the oceans in the same way. This is a one degree ocean model simulation. This is a, and, and look how fuzzy it is. You really can't see any structures much in the ocean. We get down to a quarter of a degree simulation and we can see all sorts of structures emerging. These are the Agulhas rings of the Agulhas current running down the coast of South Africa here and being shed off around the tip. And when we get to a twelfth of a degree, we really start to see some amazing structures in the ocean. And these are not just pretty pictures. These eddies in the ocean transport heat around the ocean system. They're absolutely fundamental 
to how the ocean moves heat around. And here's the Gulf Stream here, running up across here. And in the, a one degree ocean is typical of the latest climate change models. Um, but this is what we now run as our workhorse, and this is what we're testing. And that's just from raw computer power. We knew we were compromising a lot of aspects of the climate system, but we didn't have the computer power to change that. In the same way, computer power has allowed us to make our models, our climate models, much more complex. And um, when I started in the Met Office, we were glad to be able to run an atmosphere. We added a land surface and then the oceans entered in the early 1990s. And of course we knew already that the oceans were going to be fundamental to how we represented the climate system. And now we know that actually you need all sorts of things. You need sea ice, you need chemistry, you need the biosphere, the carbon cycle, uh, and so on and so forth. And so these models are actually evolving now, not just from climate models, but to Earth system models. So climate science is evolving in some ways to Earth system science. This is the nature of the journey that we're undertaking. Very quickly, I wanted to just say that uh, if you're a climate scientist, any scientist always wants the best laboratory. If you're a climate scientist, what can you do? Because you can't go out and experiment in the world outside. You've got to find another way to unpick it all. And actually, of course, the models and the supercomputers are the laboratories of climate science. And uh, they are what we've used over the last few decades to test hypotheses about how the climate system varies and changes, understand the response to climate forcings, not just increasing greenhouse gases, but changes in the, the sun, all sorts of things. Pick apart the feedbacks and interactions within the climate system. We can study the observations and they can tell us something, but they can never tell us why. And it's the combination of observations, theory and models that tell us why things are happening. And we can do this what-if experiments. So very quickly, I'm going to skip through some of this, but just stop on this one. This is a nice example of a what-if experiment that Tim Palmer did uh, way back in 1985, following some very severe winters in North America, reminiscent of the win last year's winter in North America. And he wondered whether, in fact, something that was happening in the Pacific uh, was affecting what was happening in North America. So he did a what-if experiment. He said, OK, I'll increase the ocean surface temperatures in my model by up to one and a half degrees in this part of the tropical Pacific. And then I'll run a simulation and see what happens. So warmer ocean temperatures, he got increased rainfall in that region, not unsurprisingly, but has not quite, you know, it's, they're not one-to-one they're not -one because how precipitation sets up depends on the circulation. And then he found that actually this rainfall anomaly uh, anomaly here generated a whole sequence of what we would call Rossby waves uh, emanating from the tropical Pacific across the Pacific and down over South over North America setting up uh, the very cold air across this part of North America so this is way back in 1985 it's a what if experiment and it's saying Actually, I can understand where that very cold weather came from that happened in those winters. So we begin to understand now, not just that there's an association with the tropical Pacific, but why there's an association with the tropical Pacific. I'm going to skip through this um, in the interest of time. Um, and we've continued, I should say, to do that uh, uh, ever since, and a lot of my work as a climate scientist was trying to unpick those associations and understand why certain things were happening in, in the regional climate system. But of course, finally, of course, the, big, the fourth transformation of climate science has to be global warming. And this is the Keeling curve, and there's David, Charles David Keeling. Uh, and in 1958, he started to measure CO2 concentrations at Mauna Loa, and before long he noticed that they were uh, increasing year on year. 
And that started the great debate of global warming. Some people will say that this is when climate science got uh, taken over by warmest theories and was uh, uh, taken away from a, f a proper science and, and influenced by the politics of global warming. I fundamentally disagree. My career has not been that way. I think the service of models uh, to the whole issue of global warming has been immensely important and there is no sense in which the climate science has ever been compromised by the requirement to prove something about global warming. But this has been a major transformation. And of course, we can go back to, um, and I remember this all starting up, here's one of the most influential papers, Manabi and Wetherald in 1974, uh, doing the first general circulation model simulation of a two times CO2 atmosphere. And uh, a lot of the things that they noticed are things that we would recognize today. And we began at that time to do similar studies. And in fact, I did one with uh, Peter Roundtree round about that time where we looked at uh, how the assumptions we made about water vapor feedback and cloud feedback would change how much uh, global warming you got when CO2 concentrations were doubled. I have to say that when I did the work way back in the mid 70s, I thought of it more as an academic exercise. I didn't realize anything then of its political significance. But of course, we now know from observations that the human influence on the climate system is clear, not just in surface temperatures, not just in atmospheric temperatures but in things like snow cover, in things like ocean heat content, in sea level rise, in changes in the polar regions. And of course, one of the things that uh, Manabi and Wetherill had always had picked up right from the start there was that one of the great fingerprints of greenhouse gas uh, induced global warming was a cooling of the stratosphere. And for me, that's still one of the most profound uh, demonstrations of the evidence of greenhouse gas induced global warming and of course uh, models were vital in attributing the changes that we've seen in the climate system from observations to the presence of increased greenhouse gases in the atmosphere and this is an example here of a set of whole slew of model simulations and the observations in black showing that with anthropogenic and natural forcings, you can reproduce the observed temperature changes. And that without them, you can't. And this was really where the models were able to uh, allow us to say that it's extremely likely that most of the observed increase in global surface temperature since 1951 is caused by human influence. This is the latest fifth assessment report. And of course, I think as a result of all that work, that great body of, of development of climate science, we come to climate change a defining problem for the 21st century. This is, I think, the most important uh, graph from the fifth assessment report, which just shows that as we accumulate carbon in the atmosphere from our emissions, this is the cumulative emissions since 1850 along here, against temperature and these are the observations and then these are the model projections at 2100 depending on what we decide we can do about our emissions <coughs> of carbon and if we believe that two degrees above the uh, pre-industrial average is our limit then we have to limit our total emissions the accumulation of our emissions to a thousand gigatons, what's called the trillionth ton. And we're already halfway there, if not more, and emissions are increasing. So at the moment, we're certainly heading up this line here. These sorts of temperature differences are things that will be very damaging for the planet. And I'm not going to talk about that anymore tonight because I think that's uh, really important that, that uh, uh, it deserves another lecture. 
But what climate science has to do now is to help us plan for a safe and sustainable future in the context of that diagram. And it's worth going back to Margaret Thatcher's words when she opened the Met Office Hadley Centre in 1990, where she said, we would be taking a great risk with future generations if, having received this early warning, we did nothing about it or just took the attitude, well, it will see me out. The problems do not lie in the future, they are here and now. And it is our children and grandchildren who are already growing up who will be affected. This is 25 years ago, this year, since the Hadley Centre was opened. And since then, we've had a whole succession of IPCC assessments, right from the same time that the Hadley Centre was opened. And here's Sir John Horton here, who was the chairman of the first report, right through to the one that was published uh, a couple of years ago. And some of the other later bits of the report last year. And we now, where are climate models now going? Well, they're getting us back to the weather. So we're going back to what we started with, with Mark Twain. Weather is, climate is what we expect, weather is what we get. And what we see is increasing of, uh, occurrence of extreme events around the planet. And more and more now, climate science is able to say that global warming has made a contribution, anthropogenic climate change has made a contribution to these events. We can use our science with our models, with theory and observations to show that climate change is here and now. You can never say that one of these events is due to climate change, of course they're not. They're part of weather. But what we can say is that 50 years ago, that weather pattern, that weather system, would have not been as severe as it is now because of climate change. So let's go back to last year, and this is where I put my head above the parapet. What about the floods of last winter? What can we say about those? Well. Actually, when we look at where they came from, this is the winds in the upper troposphere. These are the jet streams. What we can see, a Rossby, stationary Rossby wave forming. Here, a great buckle last January in the jet streams compared with what we normally see for a long-term average climate. And we can see this great buckle, this huge uh, very strong northerly winds down over Canada and the USA, crippling cold in the USA, feeding a very much stronger jet stream over the North Atlantic, bringing us those very severe storms we had. So that's how the general circulation looked. Where did it come from? Well, remember I talked about Tim Palmer, relating it back to the tropical Pacific. If we look at the rainfall last year, the West Pacific was very, very disturbed, very wet, um, and in fact, very wet north of the equator here. And what we can see is a whole stream of Rossby waves, again, contributing to the wet weather that we had over the UK. So it looked, as we now understand it, very much like the situation we see in La Nina situations. <coughs> So last winter, we could actually explain why the extreme storminess happened. Where did it come from? It came right out here of the, the West Pacific. But did climate change have a role to play? Well, uh, there were lots of bits of evidence. Warming oceans, rising sea levels, more intense rainfall, more extreme events, increased storminess. And we can see when we look at uh, past records now, uh, many more times in the last decade or so that we've had wet extremes and hot extremes. So it's not, as I said at the time, it's not a definitive answer. And this is one of the issues with climate science and climate change, is because of the nature of the system, there are no definitive, really definitive answers. But there's lots of evidence that suggests that there's a link. And actually, sometimes we need to come out and say that actually some of the fundamental physics of climate change means that actually you can't ignore some of the evidence. So 
This is, there is no evidence to counter the basic premise, that's fundamental moist thermodynamics, that a warmer world will lead to more intense daily and hourly rain events. So we do have to say that sometimes. The observational evidence is coming in. We may not be able to give an absolute definitive answer, but fundamental physics tells you that something is far more likely. So is it a comfortable place to be? Well, no, it's not. And I always like this quote from uh, Thomas Jefferson that Susan Solomon used when she was chair of the working group one for the fourth assessment report. And this is very much how I sort of feel my career has gone in a way from um, the tranquil pursuits of science uh, by rendering them my supreme delight, which indeed they, they have over many years. And but the enormities of the times in which I have lived have forced me to commit myself on the boisterous ocean of political passions. And since I became Met Office Chief Scientist, that's undoubtedly where I've gone. And so climate science has become actually deeply embedded in politics. And it's for that reason that I think we have to maintain the integrity of the science. We have to be open and transparent. But actually we have to be very, very clear about a few things about the, the, the climate system. It is a complex system. There will be no black and white answers. There will be, there are interactions across space and time that are immensely complex. This is just a schematic of a, in this case, something quite different, but actually there are elements here that is what, this is what the climate system is about. It's about the small things, the clouds and how they come together, the weather systems and how they work that give us the emergent properties of the climate system that I described earlier on. And we can see very clearly the, the emergent properties of the models are really give us confidence. Here's the rainfall distribution from the model. Here's what I showed you earlier. It's not perfect, but by gum, it's jolly good. And it comes out of simply a set of equations with some very simple fundamental constraints. The only constraints on these climate models is fundamentally the rotation rate of the planet, which defines the Coriolis force, and how much solar radiation, how much energy from the sun enters the top of the planet. Some aspects of the atmospheric composition, but remember, water vapour is generated by the model. It's the fundamental greenhouse gas. And yet these models produce a climate that was within a degree or two of what's observed. And they produce a rainfall distribution that is remarkably close to what's observed. And they have weather systems that are remarkably close to the statistics of weather systems that we observe in the real world. These are cyclonic storms, winter storms, the number of storms in the top panel and the intensity of these storms in the bottom panel. One's a simulation and one's observations. So these models are simulating weather with real skill. So the emergent properties can be, and we continually test, and it is remarkable how many of the emergent properties of these models now are there, correspond with the observations. We have monsoons, we have El Ninos, we have a thermohaline circulation, so on and so forth. But they are complex systems, so there'll always be people out there who will say they're wrong. Um, and then, of course, finally, you have the flap of the, the uh, seagull's wings. You have chaos. And chaos operates not, and Lorentz was talking about it in terms of weather forecasting, but actually chaos operates throughout the system on t all time scales. And so chaos is something that we have to live with, hence the ensemble prediction approach that we use. And it's one of the reasons why we can never be certain, because the flap of the seagull's wings really affects everything about the climate system, its natural variability and so on. And so mechanisms for change, well, I think the future of climate science uh, is really, really important because we have some massive questions to answer that needs the science that we do. Um, we need to give society a roadmap that indicates 
what climate variations and changes. And it's not just about climate change. It is about those climate variations as just as important. Um, can we make society more resilient and better prepared for hazardous weather? Climate is what you expect, weather is what you get. We need to be able to talk about the frequency and intensity of extreme or hazardous weather and climate extremes that arise maybe from an El Nino event like that famine in India in 1876 and 77. Do we know what levels of climate change could be dangerous where and for whom? I think the use of a global mean temperature as a metric for negotiations on climate change has done climate science a great disservice because it's reduced what is a very complex and sophisticated science to a single number, number and suggested that it's quite simple to do a zero order calculation and you get an answer. And so for me, if it's one thing we should do is move well away from, from those ideas of dangerous climate change because it is about dangerous where and for whom and when. And for some parts of the world, climate change is already dangerous. And then what, of course, shall we do to mitigate and adapt to climate change to avoid its worst impacts? So I think that brings, brings me to a rather long, end of a rather long lecture. My apologies. It, uh, it, it, it was, um, there was so much to talk about because it is such an absolutely fascinating topic. But what I hope I've done is given you a sense of the, um, how the subject has evolved and how actually there's so, so much more to climate science than just climate change science. Um, that science, of course, has to underpin climate change. But actually, it's never been driven by just trying to come up with an answer on climate change. It's always been driven about, can we understand the climate that we live in better? And uh, can we use that understanding to predict the future so that we can take action? So thank you for listening. Thank you very much indeed for illustrating so well this very complex interrelated systems that uh, control the Earth's climate, uh, that disciplines, many disciplines are involved and the major advances that have come through ever increasing computing power. When my father was small, he was sure that BBC meant big black cloud. And throughout his life, he was entranced by weather, addicted to the shipping forecast and the synoptic weather charts. And of course, Julie has just shown us how in just the last few decades, with the computing power that is now available, how climate science and meteorology has moved dramatically from those, those just paper daily charts. And we, we trust the Met Office. If they say it will rain, we take an umbrella. The forecast for today said it was going to start raining gently in the middle of the afternoon, and, and it did. Nowadays, the, the forecasts are normally correct, even in some fine detail. But as we all know, on the much greater issue of climate and climate change, we, as a society, are somewhat reluctant to listen to the advice given to us by those who know most about meteorology and, and climate. We trust them on one hand when deciding about our umbrella or not, but not for the longer term. Or rather, perhaps the, uh, the movers and shakers and the politicians are reluctant to take their longer term advice. So, like Cassandra at the fall of Troy, there is a warning, but the warning is not universally listened to. We can only hope, and again for the sake of our children and our grandchildren, that the price that's paid for not fully listening is less than the price that Troy paid. So, thank you, Julia, very, very much indeed.